I think uh, Sarah and uh, Hilda both nailed it. Communication is the key because if you communicate everything from the beginning, whether you want to do it monthly or quarterly or yearly, you should, uh, even if you're single, you should be able to have a plan set for what you want to do. And if it's two of you, then obviously you need to communicate that and make sure you have the same goals. And then uh, the, the splitting accounts, especially being African, I think I love this rule, which I've told a lot of my friends and they're practicing it. And most of the issues that they were having with finances have been solved, which is the 75-25. Uh, that means you bring in all your 75% and he brings in all their 75%. You put it in the same account and then you split it into your savings emergency or whatever. And the other 25 is your spending account. And that leads to us Africans that have so much people that depend on us and rely on us. And that 25 is what you take out and spend on whoever your cousin is that's calling you every month that's needing money. Because if not, you're going to have one of the partners that you have so many families that depend on you and they will end up giving and giving and giving to the point that they give away what was supposed to be meant for your own family here. And that always brings a problem. And I think when you say 50-50 uh, marriages uh, fail because of finances, I think most African marriages that fail in the diaspora, I would say about, about 90%. It, it's because of finance and so, finance is relating to probably sending money back home to Africa to their family. Yes, because, because Juka, when we are here, we are here and we have so many people that rely on us that depend on us. And you always have that guilty feeling that you have more than and you want to share. And if you don't know when to say no to people, which is one thing that we also need to learn and teach ourselves, you end up giving to the point that you give what you don't have and that becomes a problem for the family. And based off of what you just said in terms of like Africa is a diaspora and uh, sending money back home, I think that's where that's critical, right? So like in terms of like uh, what Sarah mentioned where you put everything in one pot. So let's say if both, <laughs> both partners put everything in one pot, but maybe one partner has like maybe way more responsibility in Africa, that means that person would just be taking from that pot and sending it to Africa and then maybe the other partner will feel some type of a way that, okay, I'm working all this money and it's all going to the wife or the husband's family. So I think, yeah, that's where, I think what Jay mentioned that would be helpful. Like if you do a split, whether it's 75, 25, 50, 50, and then each one of you just manage maybe the other one. And then you could, if you want to take all of your 50% and send it to Africa, and then that's what you want. Ultimately, whatever you decide on, is what's important as as you come together as a couple and say hey we're gonna try this out even if you do something for a year let's say like let's do the 75 25 for a year and let's see how that feels does it does it sit well with us ultimately you both want to agree on what your plan is if it's 50 50 if it's a if it's a hundred percent you're both putting a hundred percent into the exactly. the marriage pot and then you decide from there like who you're gonna help or what your charitable giving looks like you just need to make sure that you're on the same page. So speaking of being on the same page, it's really critical that you talk about uh, something that we don't like to talk about, which is um, life insurance, which is really insurance for when uh, your partner might pass away. So nobody, nobody wants to have this conversation. It's not a comfortable conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Definitely not a dating uh, conversation. The life insurance, we could, that one we're not going to say, huh? When, when, when you die. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that would be yeah. the end of that dating, right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I have not married you yet and you're already thinking about me dying so you can take my, what? <laughs> it's time for me to call it a quit. Life insurance. Let's talk about it when you marry. Uh, but it's important that you're protecting your family in the event that you were to leave this earth earlier than intended, make sure that you have protected your family. So the recommended uh, percentage is 10 times your income. So whatever your annual income is, uh, times it by 10 and get life insurance in that amount. If you're a stay at home mom, you're that you still have value in that relationship and you too should still have term life insurance because it costs money to replace the tasks that you're doing whether it's childcare, whether it's uh, cooking and cleaning at home, it'll take money to replace some of those tasks at home. So life insurance is an important, important piece to get. Um, uh, I always recommend that my clients get term life insurance. 
Um, it is, it does have a term set to it, but again, uh, we want to build your wealth. So you don't, you don't need it forever. It's something that you need for 25 years typically. Uh, and then you're building your wealth in the meantime. So life insurance is one, uh, talking about, um, kids college funds, which we already talked about a little bit. Once you are out of debt, you have a fully funded emergency fund, you start saving for your own retirement. And also if it's something that's important to you to save for your kids college, that's the point that you do do it too. And again, it needs to be a really good conversation with your spouse. Is this something that's important to us uh, to be able to provide for our kids college? I, I was somebody that didn't, my parents didn't pay for my own college. I had to pay for my own college and it was, um, it was a good learning lesson. Yeah, right. My husband and I want kind of a hybrid model for our kids where we want to be able to provide for part of their college, but we're also perfectly okay with them providing for part of their college as well as part of that own, own um, growing up experience too. Okay. So we should also talk about mortgages. Um, having a house or, and owning a home is a really important investment. And when you get to the point that you're ready to do that, um, talking about how big, how small, how many rooms, where it's situated is again, a really important conversation. Um, make sure that you, your eyes don't get too big, you know, bigger than your wallets or bigger than your banking accounts and be, be reasonable with the amount of home that you want to purchase as well. Your mortgage will most likely always be your largest expense item. So being really mindful of what that looks like within your income. So in other words, not to try to keep up with the Joneses, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's a big one though, especially for Africans. Um, even in Africa itself, right? Like, uh, I feel like maybe, especially the women, if we're being honest, we are probably the ones that actually uh, make those decisions a lot more than the men would like, and say, I want to live in a big house. I want to live in this neighborhood. I want to, you know, because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, right? So what do you guys think about that? I think that's important to talk about, especially for us Africans. It's something that we do a lot, or maybe it's a universal problem for a lot of women. I think there's, Two things and I'm hoping maybe now it's changing a little bit because I remember for a long time a lot of Africans that I talked to did not really believe in like buying homes in the US yes. nothing wrong with that they would rather maybe like build a house in um, in Africa but they're living here and then they're paying rent but you could if you could afford it you could do both right like if you're living here and you're actually paying rent most of the rent are probably maybe the same amount or even more expensive than the mortgage you know, I look at like renting versus buying a house it's uh, like people just think of it as an investment like when you when you own a home it's actually your house and you you paying for it whereas if you renting you just basically waste you just basically wasting your money what you're saying makes sense but a lot of problems that we have as africans is a lot of us are here but for some reason we think we are not here we live in africa still or we are thinking we're going to be moving to africa so but we end up actually being here majority of our life so I think a lot of us make a lot of mistakes by planning and saying, I'm going to do this there, but then you are not also doing it here. So I don't know what you guys want to say about that. And I don't know, Hilda, if that also, if you see that in a lot of Nigerian communities, but a lot of Gambians for sure and Senegalese always plan about going back, but we end up being here for 30, 40 years and don't move back yet. So most Nigerians that I know, we do miss our culture back home and we think we're definitely going back home to retire fully. <laughs> So we want to have a property back home. And I think that's fine. Um, there are ways now to have a property and rent it out. Um, there are ways you can have multiple properties here in the US and both properties back home. I think that's fine as long as it doesn't infringe on your plans um, for the present, uh, because it's almost like you're planning for 20 years and 30 years out when you haven't figured out your present. I think as long as both parties are in agreement and it doesn't inflict on your present situation, it doesn't cause any financial hurdles. There is no problem with having properties abroad, properties where you are right now. Um, just find a way to turn that into an investment and you get a return. Right? What if you are here and you don't have enough money to have properties on both, you just have four here, but you take that and you build there instead of here? In um, I, think it's a, I think it's all about a personal preference but to me I would say like I'm living here right now right that's kind of like where my family is if it's a choice between the two right like whether you build I build a house here or I build a house back home I'll say I'll start here first right because this is where I'm living if I can afford it and build a house here and I want to build a house back home sure and like like Hilda mentioned right right now there's like so many other options you could actually you could build a house back home and rent it out the number one thing that we need to think about as human being is living for the moment 
mm. and see what's best for you and do it. Because when you leave for tomorrow and you don't know what it, you're going to be there, what tomorrow is going to bring you, are not sure of. But we know for now that you are here. Make this your home. Make it as comfortable as possible and as happy as possible. And I think most of the time that's the problem. When you say don't compare yourself to the Joneses or don't try to be the Joneses, don't compete with others. Try to compete with yourself today. I think that's what we need to change the mindset. And that will definitely help us in all the relationships that we encounter. And the last part that I just wanted to talk about was also making uh, your kid's life comfortable here. But I feel like maybe some of us might be planning ahead 20 years from now to put all of our resources for 20 years from now while you're not comfortable here and your kids are not also comfortable here. I, I mean, I think that's not fair to the children because you're planning 20 years from now, but 20 years from now, your kids are not going to be kids anymore. They're going to be grown. So you didn't give them that comfortable life that they deserve that you could have actually afford, but you were thinking about 20 years from now for yourself. I would say that I am where I am today because my parents made some hard choices and made some sacrifices. Even though my parents, my father and mom um, couldn't afford college education, they took loans um, to make sure that I went to school and had at least a bachelor's degree. And he did the same for all of his kids. He made that decision because he knew the importance of education. And I think some or most of African parents that are more exposed and getting the, the education that they need, give them that life experience to know the value of education and they try to incorporate that into their kids. So personally, I always think of my kids and put them in my plans and not just them being kids at the moment, it's also for their future. And that's why when you plan, you try to put everything into perspective, make your plans for now be a stepping stone for your future plans. Right. Most of our African parents with the exposure, they, they saw the importance of education and the importance their kids will have when they have the right foundation. In Africa, it doesn't really matter where you live, right? Normally, because you have access to education everywhere. Even if you're in the village, there will still be good schools or maybe in the city or wherever. But in America or in the West, I don't know about Europe, but here for sure, zip code matters. What can we talk about quickly in terms of planning with the families, with the kids in mind, in terms of zip codes and stuff with education? As African parents, we have to be cognizant of the kids. Like when we're doing all the planning and we're saying, oh, we want to build all this stuff back in Africa. But then you also have to think of, okay, are your kids being taken care of over here, right? Because you don't want to just build and build and there's nothing wrong with building for the extended family and stuff, but your kids should be like your number one priority. And like Hilda mentioned, the education yeah, part is like, important, right? And usually that's also an investment. It's like where you live. It depends on what area you live. That's pretty much where your kids will go to school. So yeah. if you send all your money back home and then kind of like find um, a place maybe that's not really in the best neighborhood, et cetera. That means that those are the schools that they will go to. I would just add to that. Um, I, I agree that education is important and making sure that our kids have a good foundation is, is critical as we give them kind of a leg up um, on the next stage of life. You know, kids are flexible. They don't need all the things that we think that they need or all the things that they think that they need. The, the you know, latest and greatest technology, the fanciest of shoes, like our kids don't don't need those things, right? Sometimes they want them or we want them for them. Um, but mm. just be mindful of really some of the best gifts that you can give your kids are experiences. Take them to the museum, take them for a park picnic, like spend some time with your kids that's really where the value comes in, in addition to the, the quality of education that you offer them as well. That's a fruitful discussion there, and hopefully you guys are commenting along and following this important conversation. I'm definitely learning a lot. I mean, I wasn't lying. I told you guys I don't know nothing about this topic. <laughs> I mean, I know how to deal with my finances alone, but not like if it's with someone else. But let's talk about some of the issues that marriages face based on financial problems. So. We'll call it, what would you do? Comment below, let us know what would you do. So the first one is, what would you do if you find out that your partner is secretly spending money? Secrets are the number one problems in marriage. Um, the minute a partner starts to keep secrets, it, it stems downhill from there. 
it is important to be transparent in marriage. And then when you find out that he has um, secrets, financial secrets, it, it's very important to understand why. I think that would be the first thing to do. Try mm. to have a discussion and understand why he has that. Because the secrets that he's keeping is mostly like a symptom of a bigger problem. It's important to try to uncover that problem and then you can take it from there trying to solve the problem together. Now, even even if you're honestly, you may be just doing it and not thinking about it, that's a trust problem because we're supposed to be a team. So if you're hiding something from me, that means there may be something else that I need to know that I don't know about. Is there a kid somewhere that, that I don't know that you're sponsoring? Is there, is there a girlfriend somewhere? So you start making people a think about chick. all the people. Yeah, is there a side chick? You start making people think about all the crazy things out there when in actual fact there may be nothing and also yeah. the the woman or the man whoever you hiding it from what type of person is that why would it take that other person don't only look at the other person that's hiding it. there may oh. be something with you as well that you always yell and scream because this person is sending money so it makes them i'm not trying to give them an excuse but sometimes right. depending on how we react to situation can make the other person try to hide the issues that they think is a problem. So the next one is, what would you do if you find out that your partner has an extended family with endless financial needs? Especially if you're from Africa. I was going to give this to Sarah, but hey, it might apply to Sarah too in the US. Yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it applies to Sarah as well because you have people <laughs> in America that you have cousins, you have relatives that are hand me down, hand me down yeah. all the time. <laughs> right. So let's see yeah. what you think, Sarah. Did. Lots of extended family, definitely. Um, I think it's all about boundaries. It's setting up those boundaries and having that good communication with your spouse. Um, and I have a, you know, a generous heart and I, I love to be able to give and help people that are in need, but we, we have defined boundaries about how much we're willing to give per month. And then we typically have a discussion about where, where it's going to go this month. There's different things that pop up, whether it's a family member calling or whether it's a charity that we want to give to or something that we just learned about. Um, but again, communicating what that is and having some set boundaries around that um, is, is important to establish. I, I want to help teach people all about personal finance so that they don't have to call you know, um, so that they can do it independently. I think at, at, at our very core, we all want to be able to do it independently. We don't want to have to make a call or to have to seek support. So yeah. teaching people how to handle their money better is, is the path to do that. To your, to your question, what if you have family members that have what, extended financial needs? I think you pretty much just covered the whole of Africa, right? Or, or the whole of Africa in the diaspora, pretty much. But I think like Sarah mentioned, it's all about boundaries. Like if you if you agree that maybe it's a 75, 25% rule where we discuss, if way. you set that wrong expectation that you always, you have like a, yeah. like a money tree, they just gotta keep coming. So you just have to set expectation. So uh, the next one is, uh, what would you do if you found out that your partner had a secret bank account? That one, oh no. Secret bank account simply just tells you something secret is going on and secrets are a no-no in the marriage. It's important to always get to the root cause of problems like this have that discussion try to find out what is but what happening. would you do but what would you, you do if, if you I found would, that out i would personally investigate what that account is for and where that money is going to and then when i have as much information as i can then i will approach the issue and we'll have an open discussion about it huh i feel like that might be a road to divorce because that's like that's going to be hard to come back from that because that is a huge one to literally go and not just send the money to like a relative that really needed it, but go and open the bank account, sit in the bank, sign the papers by yourself and not... Anyways, Dr. J, what would you do if you found out? I, I would be very nice to myself. I'm going to get the checkbook and write the check all of the money to myself and say nothing <laughs> and cash it out and just wait and see what, how, what you're going to say when you come home. Are you going to say something that someone stole your money? I'll leave it alone for about a couple of months and see. If you say nothing, then I'll bring it up. And then at that point, I think it would not be very pretty. And if you're watching, comment below. What would you do if you found out your partner actually had a secret bank account? Do you think that's a road to divorce? Or would you be able to figure it out and work it out? I mean, that's going to be that's gonna be hard pill to swallow. 
Yeah, I thought Hilda was very sweet. I think, you know, if, if I'm going to marry somebody, I might want to marry Hilda if I'm going to have a secret bank account. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but, but I do agree, like, you have to understand, like, what's behind it. And I think I'd want to understand, is it, is it a $25 savings account? Is it a $100 savings account because you want to buy me a gift? Like, I need to find out a little bit more context. Um, but the fact that it's secretive uh, leads me to talk to a counselor, talk to a marriage counselor, talk to a therapist, see if your marriage can be saved. Because if you've got a whole bunch of money that's stacked away in a secret account, I, I think you're right. Like it is the, it's the road to divorce unless you can really get some, um, some intervention and some real support. Yes, that, that's kind of a crazy thing. I don't know if that marriage could be saved. Maybe, you know, if the angels come down, maybe that marriage could be saved, but I don't know. That's going to be hard. So the last one here is, Obviously, uh, Sarah, we'll see how um, maybe we could apply this to Americans too, right? But what are your views? What are you guys' views in terms of uh, the woman being the breadwinner, especially with Africans? Like, how is that usually seen? And what do you guys think about that before we wrap this segment up? If the woman is the breadwinner of Japan, that doesn't often happen in the African setting, does it? I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it happens. It's just that they're not accepting it because even if you go back home to the people, like the, the women that are uh, working in the farms and are working in the markets, some of them are the breadwinners, but they mm -hmm. would not accept that they're the breadwinners because the men always think that because of ego issues, they think they're supposed to be the breadwinner. But if you look at it, if you go to the villages, most of those Women are the ones that will go find food, the ones that will take care of the kids. They will do a lot of those things and only provide the house. And that's it. So I think it, 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 women are doing more than they're accepting that they are doing because uh. of the mentality from the back in the days. And I think that's even happening in the U.S. Yes, back in the days in the U.S., a lot of men were supposed to be the breadwinners and the women were supposed to be stay-at-home moms. But now that's reversed. You have a 50-50 or most of the time the women are the ones that are breadwinners and the men are the ones that are staying at home. So are you saying like it's not made visible? Like it, it, it's happening, but it's not visible. It, it's not it, pronounced. In, Amer in America, it's obviously yeah. visible, but then in Africa, it in is Africa. not visible. Yes, it yeah. is not as visible as it is in the U.S., but it's absolutely happening, happening. every day where women are taking care of the household. I think more, more recently, it's something that's become more prevalent in African uh, homes. Previously, it's, it's been to always be the man that's the breadwinner traditionally, um, but these days, women are getting more into that role. Um, but something that helps to make it work is not to show that openly um, not for the woman not to be the decision maker in the eyes of the world um, mm. have that unism have that agreement in everything that you do so when you step outside you step out as one as opposed to stepping out as I am the breadwinner that, that helps because uh, it wouldn't work huh Maybe that's why it's more neutralized exactly. as visible for Africans in Africa. I think it all depends on the people in that relationship. Like for some people, it probably would work that maybe the woman is a breadwinner uh, in some relationship. We know definitely like in an African sense, that would just kill the ego of the guy, right? <laughs> From my view, it, it just depends on what works for you. Like what works for you may not work for me. What works for me may not work for someone else. But it, really depends. but it is happening. It's just not made visible for the whole world to know. That's kind of, that's kind of odd. I don't know when in society we'll be able to accept it and just make it normal that, okay, if the man is, if the woman is making more than the man is okay, just like the men would make more. I don't know. Uh, maybe it'll take some more uh, decades <laughs> for that to be normalized, especially in the eyes of African. Is this the same issue here in the West, you think? Or is it is it actually more acceptable here? Uh, uh, I think it might be a little bit more acceptable, but I, I think that there's still some very rooted um, components of the, the spouse or the husband um, wanting to be the breadwinner traditionally wanting to take care of his family. That is kind of their traditional sort of male dominant role. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it matters where you are. That's still part of part of that sort of societal piece that's happening. Um, again, I don't know that we all need to like walk out, walk out of our houses. Like I don't remember if Ole was saying it earlier, but with the amount of money that we bring in, you know, each year or whatever, I, I don't think we have to tout it, you know, one way or another. I think as Hilda was saying earlier, like we go out together, like together we're a team and 
um, together, we tackle our finances together. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, um, truly like who's making more than the other, as long as you're working together at, at mm. uh, taking care of your family. Right. As a union, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that brings us towards the end of this conversation called marriage and finances. Hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. So uh, continue to comment below and take some time and share this video so that we could spread the sisters show community, as we always say, and on that note, we're going to have to uh, ask Sarah if she has any uh, social media pages that she wants to share with the audience in case you need some financial guidance. Yeah, I'd love to share. I am over at Instagram at Journey to Influence. And I uh, would love to, love to connect with people. Um, hit me up in the DMs. I have a really fun video about how to orchestrate a dream date with your spouse. I might, I might have to re-record in order to talk about how to do it, uh, not at the second date, but as you're dating. Uh, but uh, let me know if you'd like that. I can send that out to you. And then I have a free guide uh, called the five-step plan to thrive with your finances. It's a free download. You can get it by texting the word thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E to 33777. You get the guide for free. Yeah. We get the guide yeah, for free. Yeah, totally free. Uh, I'll be texting oh, wow. you for sure. I'll be texting that <laughs> number for sure to get the guide. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah and Hilda. Of course, uh, you are going to be here with us to do the hot soup. So of course, um, we will let uh, Sarah take leave of absence from the sister show until we can have her back here when we speak about finances and hopefully on the next one she's going to give us a lot of tangible ways that we can actually um, save money not just in relationship but also for ourselves to really have a hold of our finances in a really good and lucrative way for our future and of course don't go anywhere stick around and we will be right back uh, to continue on the hot soup uh, of the day that we have for you guys we have two but for now, we'll say goodbye to Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.